Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Managing Editor of Modern Healthcare. Thank you for tuning in to our first installment of The Checkup. This is a new interview series we're doing with executives from across the industry on key issues in management and leadership. Joining us today is Michael Dowling. He's President and CEO of Northwell Health, which operates 23 hospitals in the New York City area, which as you all know, has been the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis. During the pandemic, Northwell successfully treated more than 9,000 COVID-19 patients and it created about 2,000 new beds to deal with the surge. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. We know this is an extremely busy time for you. Thank you so much. Delighted to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So let's start. Can you tell us a little bit about where things are now as we sit here in, in mid, early mid-May for Northwell? I know you, you've started to see a little bit of plateau and maybe even reduced admissions. Is that right? Well, we... Um, uh, it started in early March, and we had a continuous ramp up uh, during March into the beginning of April. For the past uh, 12 days or so, the numbers have been coming down. Uh, at our height, uh, we had about 3,500 patients in our hospitals, uh, COVID patients. Uh, we saw in total about 13,000 patients in our hospitals and about 40,000 patients in total when you include the ambulatory and the treat and release in the EDs. Um, so right now we have about 1,500, as I mentioned, and uh, the trend is continuing to go downward. And um, so we will have a lot of patients for a long time, but I believe that uh, we will continue to decrease. So we're in a much better position today than we were two weeks ago. It's more manageable, it's not as hectic. Uh, we're not trying to create new beds every day, which we were in the height of the, of the crisis. Uh, but we got pretty hit pretty hard here in New York, and our hospitals were smack in the middle of the of the heaviest, most densely, uh, most dense area where the crisis hit. As you think about uh, sort of that plateauing, but then we look forward to the fall. I imagine you're starting to worry about a potential resurgence. So, what lessons have you can you apply to the fall that you learned from earlier on? Well, we were a little bit fortunate uh, here in Northwell because we put together years and years ago an emergency management system to deal with crises like this. So we have a very formal um, built-in infrastructure in our health system, and we use it for Ebola, for H1N1, SARS, etc. And so that's a, that's a kind of a permanent entity that is a structure here. It's part of our DNA. It's how we operate. And it's very, very organized. So we are um, right now putting the plans together for the specifics of what it is we might have to do in the fall if this ramps up again. Uh, but we're in a much better position having gone through the serious crisis over the past six weeks. Um, we, you know, it's all about beds. It's about staff, which is the biggest issue. It's about PPE. Um, it's about testing. And of course, we're much more tuned to the needs of the testing today than we were at the beginning when this whole thing happened in March. So we're much better positioned. And um, I think it will be much more seamless, even though we did not have the problem a lot of other places had and dealing with it uh, during the past six weeks, but we will be better positioned for the fall. So let's talk about that staff issue a little bit. I know uh, dealing with 23 hospitals, more than 70,000 Front, you know, staff across the system. What's that been like for you, um, just in trying to manage morale? Well, uh, a couple of things. One is that um, the staff issue is by far the most difficult uh, because uh, you have all of these staff, but you've only got X number of staff that can deal with the crisis on the front lines: the ICU staff, the the, the primary care docs, the nurses, etc. So what we did is we have about 800 ambulatory locations. So we're not just a hospital system. 50% of our business is non-hospital. So we shut down not only our surgery, a lot of our surgery, except for that that was life-threatening, but we also closed a lot of our ambulatory sites. So we moved the ambulatory staff into the hospitals. Um, and that's the reason that we closed some of the ambulatory, it was for the staff reasons. So that became a major central part of our operations. We have a daily dashboard, and HR did a terrific job on this. And we were able to move staff around uh, because we work as a system. We were able to move staff from various locations, one location to another location. Uh, we brought in staff from around the country. We brought in agency staff. 
Uh, for example, Intermountain Health was extraordinarily helpful. They sent a lot of staff here over the last couple of weeks. In fact, I visited with about 35 of their staff last week that were leaving to go back to Intermountain. So I want to thank them. So that kind of help among systems um, is something, by the way, that for the future ones, I am going to have an ongoing continuous relationship with some of these other systems where if we're in trouble, they help us. If they're in trouble, I help them. Um, because distance doesn't make much of a difference here. You can move staff around. Um, it was it was complicated each and every day, but we succeeded in making sure that we were able to do it well. One last point I mentioned, we, we have a medical school and a nursing school and a PA school. So we did our graduations earlier. Uh, well, we... And we brought our staff out and used those medical students and those nursing students on the front lines and to do certain roles that we needed to get done. So we used the constellation of all the staff working together. And one of the lessons here is that there was unbelievable interdisciplinary work going on where you had, I was on every ICU, I was on every floor of every hospital. I did it on an ongoing basis. And I would come across the cardiac staff working on the front lines with the ICU staff and providing direct care to patients. So this silos between disciplines that existed that you're always trying to break down, in a crisis like this, it just breaks down. And that interdisciplinary nature of how we work together is a lesson that I hope that we don't ever fall back to the old way completely. And, that, um, and it was a learning experience for everybody. Everybody that was involved in this learned something different than they knew before. Well, that's a, a topic I'm curious about. So no, healthcare is notoriously snl, slow at adopting changes, value-based mm -hmm. care, breaking down those clinical silos. As you think about the silos you're talking about, how do you ensure that going forward, um, well, I, you keep those broken apart? I mean, you yeah, keep those together. It's, it's, it's part of the culture. And I mean, it's not just the staff and the discipline, the disciplinary part of it. It's uh, We created uh, almost uh, 1,900 new beds during this crisis. We were creating 200 beds a day. And if during normal times, I were to say to the staff, I need you to open up 200 new beds, I would have a lot of analysis. I would have business plans. I'd have a lot of gnashing of teeth and, oh my God, we can't do it. Yet in the crisis, we did it overnight. When we had a problem with vents, instead of going around screaming about not having enough vents, we took the BiPAP machines and we converted them to vents and did it in a couple of days. When we um, didn't have enough swabs, we went to our 3D printing cap capability and we created swabs. We created our own, uh, working with an outside company. So that kind of speed of innovation, that speed of creativity, creativity is something that we're going to do our best to make sure that we enhance going forward, which means that we have to break down some bureaucracy that obviously grows into organizations over time. No matter how efficient you try to do, our B, bureaucracy grows. This is a great opportunity now coming out of this crisis to clean house, break down bureaucracy, uh, become more efficient, be more fast paced and move quicker than we have ever done before. If we haven't learned that lesson from this, we will, you know, we will be foolish not to take advantage of it. So I'm also curious about the uh, collaboration that's happened across health systems. Obviously, as you said, you brought in you were able to bring in people from Intermountain or Intermountain sent some people to you. There's been collaboration, I imagine, among the New York hospitals. How do you think going forward uh, that collaboration can continue? Okay, let me deal with it from two perspectives. One is the collaboration inside our own system. And if there is one uh, logic that demonstrates the benefit of systems, dealing with the coronavirus crisis proved it. Because if we were individual hospitals alone, we would have been dead here. Let me give you an example, because we, we, we are very integrated at Northwell. We were moving every day 60 to 70 patients from some of our hospitals to other hospitals. Because in our hospitals in the Queens border in Manhattan, New York, we got swamped. Our hospitals in that area, no possible way could they handle the volume. Hundreds and hundreds of new patients every day. And because we have a central transport system, I was able to move patients from that area, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles away to other areas. That system is uh, proved. And then um, the collaboration among the, the big systems in New York, 
and because I worked very closely with the governor on all of this, which he asked me to do. And the big five big systems, we started to get together every other morning, virtually. And we, the CEOs only, and we would talk, we would collaborate, we would share information, we would learn from one another about clinical practices. Um, I ran the Javits Center, Northwell ran the Javits Center during this crisis, and that helped to ease the burden from some of these other hospitals. So that collaboration uh, was very beneficial, and I'm hoping that given the, 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 the given the sense of camaraderie that developed between us, that despite the fact that we will always be competitive, which is good, by the way, that there are areas where we can actually work together. And then the, the relationships with other systems around the country, um, and big hospital system up in Rochester, New York, in Syracuse, Rochester, New York, uh, sent down staff to us, Intermountain sent staff. And those, and I've said to Mark Harrison at Intermountain, we are now, whether we like it or not, we're partners. Their staff and our staff worked together, became friends, et cetera. So, and we will be there to reciprocate to Intermountain if ever, that ever happens again. So that all of those benefits, I hope, uh, will will have a, a tale to them that is that is positive, and that we don't forget about it and go back to the old traditional ways of doing business. Just like telemedicine became a big part of our business, that's going to accelerate and continue big time going forward. A lot of our staff work from home. Thirty thousand of our staff work from home during the crisis. And we are now working on a plan as to how many of them should continue to work from home. They may not need to come in where they can do, uh, when it's uh, technology oriented, they can do a lot of stuff from home. So there's, there's a lot of things here that uh, we are going through right now to make sure that as we come out of this, that we're going to be a different organization going forward and a better one, I think. I think the lessons here, we can become a better organization. Well, great, Michael, we really appreciate your time. There's a lot that we could talk about for hours and hours here, sure. but we wanna be kind of brief in these, uh, this checkup Give folks uh, in and out if you can. So we appreciate your time. We know you're extremely busy. We'd love to check back in with you from, from time to time on how things are going. Again, thanks and stay safe. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. And now I'd like to bring in our Modern Healthcare's operations reporter, Alex Kasich, to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things he's been seeing on the front lines as he's been reporting the stories. Alex, thanks for joining me today uh, from down the street here in Chicago. You have a story in this week's issue that looks at how health systems, including Northwell, uh, have collaborated. And we heard Michael Dowling talk about that during the pandemic with folks coming in from Intermountain. But you looked at some other health systems as well. Talk a little bit about what you heard from those sources in terms of the biggest challenges they were facing. Well, like Mr. Dowling was saying, uh, this has prompted an unprecedented response. Um, and particularly on the staffing side, uh, where this has required folks to step into areas and out of their comfort zones where they haven't practiced prior. So you have orthopedists and, uh, and other types of doctors who are working in this ICU as somewhat of an intern saying, what can I do to help? Well, you know, I'm here to do whatever I can. You have caregivers traveling, you know, 2,000 miles across the country to go to a hotspot uh, and try to do the best they can to alleviate this immense burden. And what I'm hearing uh, is a stark contrast in terms of how hard it is on a day-to-day -day basis to deal with the emotional burden and stress and, and physical requirements needed to work around the clock and treat all these sick patients. Um, and and it's, it's devastating to hear these stories uh, from the firsthand perspective of nurses and doctors, but at the same time, they are conveying a level of humanity, uh, collaboration, and camaraderie that uh, has inspired them and they hope will stick going forward. Um, a scale uh, in terms of innovations and solutions, when you look at telemedicine, uh, you look at uh, researchers that are crunching some of this data uh, to figure out who is most vulnerable and least vulnerable to best direct care pathways and who gets tests and prioritized for care. Um, so in one end, uh, it's, it's incredibly sad and moving to listen to how this has affected so many people uh, in our country, but at the same time, it's heartening to see how the healthcare system as a whole has responded. Yeah, I think it's interesting, 
from what you're talking about, from your reporting, and then what Michael Dowling was talking about, um, just how these changes that have happened over the industry, uh, if they will hold on, you know, healthcare, obviously, as you know, has been notorious at not, at not embracing a lot of change. So it'll be interesting to see how a year from now, if some of these collaborations still exist, or if we've gone back to the, the old way of doing business. One area that I also wanted to touch on with you that you've covered a lot about is the, the post-acute in the nursing home industry in particular, which obviously is being ravaged by COVID-19 cases. What are you hearing from those sources in terms of sort of long-term implications? So I talked with some folks at Marin Health. Uh, they're in the Bay Area, in California, and they're teaming up with Kaiser and the Public Health Department in, in Marin County. And that's a newly formed partnership. Uh, and they form these mobile care units. And they're dispatching caregivers uh, to go to these nursing homes. And it's an education opportunity where they're teaching uh, about proper control, uh, infection control mechanisms, uh, how to best respond uh, to this uh, pandemic. And, and, and they're taking a more collaborative approach, but they're also seeing this from a different perspective. You know, they're, uh, they're tapping commun the community at large uh, who are donating like hand-sewn masks and other equipment, um, but you know they're they're going firsthand into these nursing homes and uh, where their resources aren't available and bringing it to them. But also, uh, it's taken a more personal approach to them. Whereas some of this would have been handled behind a desk and someone else uh, you you would have signed off as an administrator um, or a manager of a department. Whereas uh, now they're going in and. Uh, treating these really elderly patients, you know, at where they are and trying to make them as comfortable as they are um, in these nursing homes. And so it's adding a whole level of depth and, and purpose to their work. But uh, in terms of the long-term changes of uh, skilled nursing facilities, um, it's been an industry a sector that's been beleaguered by certain quality issues, uh, given uh, a lack of resources when it comes to not as much staffing uh, typically as other sectors, um, and and that's put them in a difficult position. So uh, I imagine there will be need there will need to be some more long term changes to those operating models to be more uh, effective and efficient going forward. Right, right. Well, Alex, thanks for joining me today. Uh, stay safe, and we look forward to more of your reporting. Thank you, Matt. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for the first installment of The Checkup. We'll be back with a new episode on May 18th. Be sure to look for updates on modernhealthcare.com and on our social media channels. Stay safe, everyone.